Thanks, Rita. You're watching Southeast today. Our top story tonight. Southeast Water say exceptional circumstances led to recent failures and they're confident of restoring supplies for Christmas. Well, I'd like to apologise um, for the inconvenience. I know that not having water causes, but I'd also like to reassure them that we are working really hard um, to try and get that back on. As ambulance workers go out on strike, the army is drafted in to support emergency services in Brighton. On the right track, why rail companies are trying to recruit more female drivers. And we're in Brighton, where thousands of lanterns are lighting up the darkest night of the year. Hello, thousands of people across Kent and Sussex are still without water tonight as the chief executive of South East Water says exceptional circumstances led to recent failures in supply, but they're confident water will be back on for Christmas. The outages are affecting people living in Tunbridge Wells, Wadhurst, Crowborough, Pease Pottage, Crawley Down and many of these villages in between. Bottled water stations of today opened at the Beacon Academy in Crowborough and outside Tesco in Pembury. South East Water has apologised again, maintaining that the rapid thaw of frozen pipes has increased the level of bursts and leaks on its underground network of pipes. In a moment, we'll be hearing from the company's chief executive. First, Sarah Smith reports from Tunbridge Wells. Everyone expects a trip to the supermarket before Christmas, but not for this. Strictly rationed bottles of water being handed out in the car park at Tesco in Pembury. I only live round the corner, but I've got an 87-year-old mother, um, and it's been it's been difficult. At this leisure centre in Tunbridge Wells, an invite has gone out to those who just need a hot shower. Every single message they've put on the internet to say when it's coming back on hasn't happened apart from once over the last. We've had nothing for six days. I mean, we've come to play yeah. tennis and have a bath, shower. This morning on Radio Kent, South East Water said things were improving, but there were no guarantees supplies would be back by Christmas. It's going in the right direction, but I don't want to 100% uh, commit to it at the moment. I can't do that yet. Plans for a proper Christmas after two pandemic ones are under threat. I'm just hoping that it's back by Christmas, because obviously it's going to have a massive impact if it isn't. Um, I think everyone's going to have to move to other people's houses. That's what people are already sort of saying, where can we go if it's not going to be back on and things like that. So We're not sure what we're going to do about that at the moment. Um, we've got people coming, but we may have to cancel it. Hopefully it's all going to be OK by then, yeah. But um, we don't know, do we? I mean, it's, um, we, we're not getting an awful lot in the way of updates. We've got a, a water company that doesn't seem to be able to deal with the emergency that is unfolding. I mean, yesterday, for example, I had one job, which was to keep the one water distribution point fully stocked, and it ran out of water, and people just don't have you know, security about when they're going to have their water supplies back on. At the Kidney Dialysis Centre in Tunbridge Wells, they've had no water for a week. Dozens of patients have been sent to Guy's in London instead. For those who provide the voice of the water company customers, the timing could not be worse. It's especially difficult now when people and businesses are so busy. You know, people are at home because of the festive season, they need needing the water more, and businesses as well. This is their busiest time of year. South East Water has three days to go before it becomes the company which cancelled Christmas. Sarah Smith, BBC South East Today, Tunbridge Wells. Well, earlier we were able to put some of your questions to South East Water's Chief Executive David Hinton. I started by asking him why supplies had been intermittent for some customers for weeks. It's been an exceptional year. It's, um, we've had um, one in 300 um, heat waves, we've had flooding, we had the storm news and the winds which affected our supply as well. So the, so the system over the last 12 months um, has been really stressed, in particular in recent weeks. But lots of people wondering, for example, Michael got in touch with us on email, wanting to know, is it, is it out-of-date infrastructure? Is that what the problem is? Is the, is the system just not equipped to cope? I mean, undoubtedly the infrastructure is under strain, but I would go back to the... Um, I would go back to the... It's under strain due to the, the, the impact of the weather we've had this year. It's been a highly exceptional year um, and it's really strained the network. And we've got solutions um, and we're building those solutions in. 
um, but it's just this year has been very, very different. Um, we've the, the same system has held up for numerous decades, um, and we've invested in the network year after year. Uh, to, to sustain that network, it's just the pressures on it have been exceptional over recent months and years. But this seems to be a pattern now. This has been going on for some people, as I said, not just the last few days, but for weeks and months. Uh, Neil has been in touch on email to ask, what is the plan to stop this happening? People can't keep living like this, not knowing whether water is going to come out of their taps. Well, you know, we've got, we've got plans in place. And like I say, we're, we're, we're very confident we can get customers on uh, for Christmas. I think that's really important. Um, and all the treatment works that are affected in the flooding I mentioned are all now back in operation. We had multiple effects of multiple impacts on, our, on one particular system. It's very unusual and very unlikely that we should expect that going forward. Sometimes these things happen and resilience is really tested when you have multiple impacts on, on the same area, which is what we've seen in the area that we're discussing. Why have your reservoir levels been so critically low? We've had a massive amount of rainfall recently. Are they fit for purpose? So the, res the reservoirs are, a, are a sort of a holding position, so that's where we store the water, a bit like a, a loft tank. So it allows us to produce water and put it into those tanks during the night, and then it drains down during the day. And there's only a certain amount of storage we can hold in those reservoirs, because otherwise the water will be no longer fit to drink, it needs to be fresh, and we produce a fresh product. So, um, so what we've seen is the demand that I talked about with 100 megalitres of extra demand in, in a matter of hours has just drained those reservoirs. I'm sure people are uh, happy to take your apology, but I think they'd be even happier to take some compensation. What can people get for their trouble putting up with this for weeks and weeks? Absolutely. Um, um, compensation is all part of our duty as a, as a, as a water company. Um, and we will look at that when this event is finished. Um, duration, impact, all the sorts of things that we consider we're making that compensation impact. And I, and I commit to us doing that when this finishes. We'll, we'll do a full assessment of the compensation that's necessary to be delivered. So what, finally, what would you like to say to your customers now? We're just a few days before Christmas. They've had to deal with on and off water supplies for days, some for much longer than that. What would you like to say to them tonight? Well, I'd like to apologise um, for the inconvenience I know that not having water causes, but I'd also like to reassure them that we are working really hard um, to try and get that back on, very conscious of Christmas, really conscious of Christmas. So we're trying to get the water supply back on before then and make it sustainable so it's not, it's no longer, um, they no longer have to worry about whether the water will come out of the tap again. OK, David Hinton, thank you for joining us. Well, many of you have been in touch to share your experiences of the past few days. Thank you for that. And please continue to do so. Email southeasttoday at bbc.co.uk or have your say on social media. Staff working for the South East Coast Ambulance Service have been on strike today in a dispute about pay and working conditions. CCAM says it still responded to life-threatening situations such as cardiac arrests, but the NHS is advising people to use the online 111 service for non-emergencies. Earlier, the Army was seen helping staff at the region's hospitals. Our health correspondent Mark Norman reports. From 6 a.m. this morning, Southeast Coast paramedics and emergency call handlers have gone from responding to patients' calls for help to responding to public support for their strike. Across the region, picket lines have voiced their concerns. What do we want? Pay! What do we want? Now! But also their frustration that things have got this far. We got to a stage that whatever we do isn't good enough. We need more resources. We need to retain the staff that we have got at the moment. They're leaving in droves to go to the private sector and doctor surgeries. And then we've got no one to send to the patients that need us on a triple nine call. It's become uh, a lot more intense, I think, because we're seeing our remit increase from just being emergency service work to being urgent care, primary care, and supporting other services who are also under an equal amount of pressure. And they are, they're struggling as much as we are. Let's be clear, it's all actually part of the same issue. The problem with low pay in the NHS and in the ambulance in particular is that we're having trouble retaining staff. Staff are working more and more overtime because they can't afford to put food on their table for their families or heat their homes. Over 50% of ambulance staff report burnout because of working so much overtime. Pay underpins everything in this service and my members deserve a decent pay rise for the job they do. CCAM have had 100 military personnel drafted in to help with demand today, here unloading patients in Brighton. For health service bosses, the message has been emergency services are there if you need them. 
if you need urgent r urgent response, then phone 999. You know, we, the phones will still be answered and people will get a response. But if you don't need that very urgent response, then please use alternatives. Use, you know, NHS 111 online. If you'd normally see your GP, go to your GP. You know, if you'd normally see your pharmacist, do that. All those things are, are still open. The strike continues until midnight. Another begins on December the 28th. Today, some paramedics left the picket line to respond to life-threatening calls. That follows an agreement between the unions and CCAM. But with no apparent solution in the offering, more strike dates are likely in the new year. Well, Mark is with me now. So, Mark, what has been the impact on the NHS today? So we haven't been told officially. I think for the ambulance service, they have seen a slight reduction in calls, but it's been busy. I think the army helping out has helped. I think the fact union members, as you saw, are prepared to leave the picket line to help in absolute emergencies has also helped. Ambulances, I think, have had a fairly, uh, rather hospitals have had a fairly steady day. But I've just come off the phone to one of our biggest trusts who say they're worried about tonight after midnight when the strike ends. They're worried about tomorrow and a build up of patients who maybe haven't called contacted 999 and then they're beginning to throw forward to between Christmas and New Year really worried about that so I think the jury is still out about the impact of today but clearly more strikes to come this isn't the last time we're going to be talking about these issues indeed Mark thank you Police say they're investigating the discovery of a man's body found in the undercarriage of a plane which flew into Gatwick. Officers say the body was found during the early hours of December the 7th on a TUI aircraft which had arrived at the Sussex airport from the Gambia. The family of a security guard from Gravesend who died after being injured in a crush at Brixton O2 Academy have paid tribute to their selfless loved one. 23-year-old Gabby Hutchinson was working at a gig there on Thursday when a large number of people stormed the venue. It's an industry where the majority of staff are men, but one South East Rail company is trying to change that by hiring more female train drivers. It's nearly 45 years since Karen Harrison became the UK's first female train driver. At South Eastern, one in 10 drivers are now women, double what it was a decade ago. And for the industry as a whole, one in seven workers are female. For tonight's special report, Charlie Rose has been to meet one train driver, hoping to inspire other women to follow in her tracks. This train will be calling all stations to London Cannon Street. Thank you. Jane Fentiman says it's her love of trains and machinery which inspired her to join South Eastern, becoming a driver of passenger trains two years ago. Whether it be a most important job interview or you're going for a doctor's appointment or I'm taking your children to school, that is what brings joy and that is why I became a train driver, is to serve. Decades ago, in an industry dominated by men, putting a woman in charge of a train would have been unthinkable. Eventually, in the late 1970s, Karen Harrison became the first woman in Britain to work as a train driver. I want to be the driver of an intercity 125. The reaction from her colleagues was hostile. It was open warfare. People wouldn't work with me. People put um, notes up about me on the notice case. My, my, my locker was um, defaced. The pornography went up in the mess room. Today, it's still far from a gender-balanced workplace, but things are changing. Well, right now, South Eastern employs a total of 1,171 drivers and 111 of those are women, which is around about 10%. And I'm told that figure is growing. South Eastern say in the past four years, they've doubled the number of female train drivers and more women than ever before are applying for the roles. It's partly the result, they say, of discussing difficult subjects. By talking about things like the menopause, things like endometriosis, fertility, etc., etc., we can make sure that we've um, got appropriate policies and procedures in place to support people going through those things, um, help them feel understood and listened to at work, and ultimately attract and retain more female members of staff across all of our roles. There's also a greater focus on flexible working. As a mother of three, that's something that's important to Jane. I actually get to drop my children, either drop my children or pick them up, because that is how sometimes it works. So I am a very present mum, despite of having quite a challenging career. 
It's a targeted recruitment campaign, encouraging more women to join the industry and aim high. Charlie Rose, BBC South East Today, near Dartford. Ah, fantastic. Now, thousands of people are lining the streets of Brighton as people carrying paper lanterns parade through the streets for the traditional Burning the Clocks event. First held in 1993, the ceremony to mark the winter solstice is back after two years of Covid cancellations. Louisa Pilbeam is there for us now. Hello, Louisa. Lots of people behind you. How are they marking the shortest day? I can just about hear you because there's a great atmosphere down here. Thousands of lanterns lighting up. Yes, the shortest day of the year. Oh, it's gone quiet. Yeah, there's been all sorts of lanterns here. Artists have been commissioned to create huge mythical creatures. There are also uh, people have made their own lanterns at home and they're heading down to Brighton Beach where there's a big bonfire and they will burn things on that bonfire to signal the end of the year. I asked the organisers to tell me a little bit more about why this event's going on. Started in the 90s, mostly kind of to hold off a bit of the winter blues a little bit. I think John Vera, the creative director and CEO of Same Sky, started it as a kind of an antidote to the excess of Christmas uh, sometimes. It can be a little commercial, so here's an absolutely really silly fun event. As I mentioned, there are all sorts of lanterns here. In fact, in recent years, there have been 20,000 people who have come down here, and it's so busy down here, certainly thousands of people here this year. It hasn't gone ahead for the last couple of years, of course, because of the pandemic. And cameraman Andrew, who's here with me tonight, told me a very interesting point, of course, from here on in the night start to get lighter. A very optimistic uh, point to leave it on, I think. Definitely. It's so nice to think that the days are getting longer again. Thank you very much, Louisa. It looks like a lot of fun down there. Thank you. Now, this week, we are bringing you some Christmas messages from some of the celebrities we've spoken to throughout the year. Our next are from Paula Radcliffe, Mark Wright, Maisie Smith and Max George. Hi, everyone and the viewers of South East Today. It's Paula Radcliffe and I just want to wish you all a very Merry Christmas. To all the viewers at South East today, a big, big happy Christmas for me. Sending you all the love in the world. Just hug your family, get them presents, love your presents, have some wine, have some food, and have fun. Merry Christmas. Hello, I'm Maisie Smith. You might know me from EastEnders or maybe from Strictly. And I'm Max George, and you might know me from The Wanted and probably not Strictly. <laughs> and, we want... <laughs> and we wanted to wish everyone a Merry Christmas, Christmas. that watches South East today. <laughs> Thank you very much and a happy Christmas to all of them too. Time now for a look at the weather forecast. John Hammond is joining us. Hello John. Hi there Ellie. Yes, uh, the winter solstice. It's been one of those uh, dark gloomy days when it hasn't really got light, has it? But uh, as you rightly say, the days are about to get longer, second by second. I don't think it'll be until uh, well on into January until we really notice the difference. Uh, but, you know, every second helps, doesn't it? Yeah, it has been rather cloudy and uh, this was the shot earlier on this afternoon. There was some patchy rain around, but uh, some late brightness in some places. We're going to see a, a similar concoction to the weather, I think, over the next few days. Quite unsettled. Uh, there'll be some rain around, some sunshine. Mild for the most part. It does look like getting chillier on Boxing Day. I think uh, the chances of a white Christmas are diminishing fast. So, there you go. The wind's coming in from the southwest, hence the mild conditions, the blobs of blue. You know what that means. Yes, some rain around. And as I say, it was uh, damp for a time earlier on. Things dry for a time through the evening, but uh, only for a time because more rain will be splashing in as we head through the night. That won't last all that long. It should clear through as we head through the early hours. But enough cloud and enough breeze to prevent temperatures from falling too low. So no frost uh, around about six or seven degrees, I think will be typical as a low. So relatively mild starts, a rather grey, cloudy starts. It's going to be another one of those uh, rather dark December days. Drips and drabs of rain from time to time. Limited brightness, more cloud than blue sky, that's for sure. And it could well be we see some of that rain turning a bit more persistent late on in the day, particularly down towards the south coast. Quite a blustery wind, you're going to notice that, but uh, it's coming in from the southwest and uh, that is always a mild direction. So once more, temperatures way up into double digits. Typically at this time of year, we'd be at sixes and sevens, of course, this time last week. We were barely above freezing. So uh, quite a contrast from one week to the other. I'm sure you'll agree.
We'll keep the mild conditions going as we end the week. Again, a bit of a breather before another area of wet weather splashes in from the southwest. That'll clear through, the skies will brighten again, and the week will end with a mixture of sunshine and blustery showers. But again, those winds coming in from the southwest means uh, once more it will be mild. Now, Christmas weekend. There is cold air trying to come down from the north, but initially at least, through Christmas Eve and a good chunk of Christmas Day, we keep those mild southwesterlies. But the blues will probably start to win this battle as we head through uh, Boxing Day. I don't think there'll be any snowfall, but on Boxing Day, you'll notice a bit more of an edge to the breeze. Temperatures will duck down a little bit uh, before they start to pick up again uh, later on next week. So yes, Ali, uh, no sign of a white Christmas, but it will be turning chillier come Boxing Day. There you go. Thank you very much indeed, John. Well, there you have it. No white Christmas, most likely, but who knows? That's it from me for the moment. I'm back with your late news at 10.30. Do join me then. Bye-bye.